Good morning, welcome, thank you for coming this morning. Okay, so I'm going to pass you over to Ed and the team to introduce themselves and uh, you've got some useful information. Right, morning ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. I'm Ed Middleton, I'm a retired police officer, retired in February. Um, been a detective for most of my career, I worked in the economic crime since 2004. Okay, so what's this all about? Basically, there's a lot of bad people out there, and they want your money. That's what they do this for. With the ex exception of violence and generally a lot of sexual offences, the only reason criminals do what they do is to make an easy buck. And they're experts at getting it. They're very clever. It's their job. It's their livelihood. So they have to be good at it. So people say, I've been the victim of fraud. It doesn't mean you've been fooled. It means someone who's very good at their job has convinced you to do something which they want you to do. They'll go to great lengths, they'll impersonate people, organisations, police, they'll use calls, they'll use text messages, they'll use emails, they'll use social media, and they'll manipulate you. So, what's the reality about fraud? It's the most common crime in the UK. So I can guarantee, whilst you may not have actually paid over money, Everybody in this room will at some stage have been subject to a fraud. Victims of fraud, they don't scream, they don't shout, they don't bleed, but they do suffer. And in my mind, a fraud, the impact on a victim is as bad as serious violence, serious sexual offence, because they sit there and they suffer in silence. These figures are taken from the Crime Survey of England and Wales. It's estimated that it costs £190 billion a year, estimated. That seven billion of that is lost by individuals. The remainder is public sector, about 40 billion, and private sector losing 140 billion. 50% of this is phishing, which is your emails, phishing or smishing. Phishing is it vishing, begins with V, is your voice calls. Smishing, begins with S, is your SMS, your text messages. 50% of all crime is likely to come over that, it's estimated. What we know is this bit here, tip of the iceberg. That's the stuff we don't know about. It's estimated that only 15% of fraud is reported. And particularly elderly victims suffer in silence. A lot of elderly victims don't want to report it because first of all, the main reporting vehicle is action fraud. It's not ideal, but it's there. If you phone, you can be ages on the phone. If you try to put it through the computer, it's not a particularly friendly interface. 60% of all losses that are made, they're not made on first contact. That first contact is a bit of a baited hook. It's just to get you engaged. 60% of all losses happen on second or subsequent contacts. So basically, what is fraud? It's theft by lying. But the fraudsters, they'll pick authority and they'll impersonate it. <coughs> NHS with the COVID frauds, revenue and customs, police. They'll impersonate family and friends. And if you do engage with them, they'll be polite. They'll be very pleasant because they want you on board. They'll use good manners. All we'd say is if you receive a phone call and you're suspicious, hang up. Very easy to say. Very, very easy to say. But you've got to satisfy people who they are. You know, if you do get a phone call and they say, call us back, don't call back straight away. Just hang up. Leave it for 10 minutes and then call whoever you think it was. So if they say, hi mum, it's your daughter here. I've lost my phone. I need a thousand pounds. Okay. Ignore that. Put your phone down. Give it five minutes. And phone your daughter. Phone your son. Did you send me that text message? Very simple. You'll find that institutions, if it's your insurance company, most insurance companies now have a protocol where if you say, no, I'm not going to give you my date of birth and my postcode, they will say, okay, we will give you this information which we know about you which is probably information which you've given them, and they will reverse convert, confirm who they are. It's not 100%, but it gives that little bit of surety. And if you're unsure, just hang up, call them back. 
because fraudsters don't necessarily just want money. They want personal data, as I said, your date of birth, your national insurance number, your maiden name. How many of you use Facebook or social media? <laughs> How many times do you see the thing? What's your first pet's, your favourite first pet's name? It's often the password. How many of your passwords, and I'm not going to ask you to say this or no, how many of your passwords is either the name of a son or a daughter, with a number one after it, and maybe an exclamation mark? That happens. They'll use that information then to clone your identity, and suddenly they've got credit cards, they've got financial means in your name, at your address. Don't give your personal information to anyone. So, those are the facts and figures about fraud. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically cover a couple of what we call the main high harm for fraud types. These are the ones which have the most impact on victims. The fraud types I'm going to cover are advanced fee, investment, romance, which is also relation dating, payment diversion, which would be particularly re relevant for you as treasurers, and courier. There are many other different types of fraud. There's a book called The Little Book of Big Scams. And what we're doing is at the moment we're getting this published, we're getting it produced in Welsh, so it's bilingual. So we're gonna have it, so it's representative of our three forces. Within the next month or so, we're hoping to have that ready for delivery. When that is, we'll be disseminating that out, and that'll be free to you. That is basically the Bible of the different types of fraud what they are, but also how people can protect themselves against them. So the first one, advanced free fraud. And this is where criminals get in touch by email, text, direct message, phone call, social media, and they say, you won, you've won the lottery. There's 10,000, 100,000 pounds waiting for you. All we need off you is 100 pounds just to release the fee. <laughs> And um, you think about it, it's great, isn't it? £100,000 for a month, it's not bad. They'll say, you've got to do this quickly. They'll put you under pressure. You've got to pay this quickly, otherwise, you know, by the end of the day, the opportunity's gone. You've lost it. Um, what we need you to do is we need to pay the money by a bank transfer. And, um, you know, it's going to be baited. You know, you may well get free goods, you may get a financial gain, you may get a service. That's the job. So, you need to pay a fee. I dealt with a fraud recently where an elderly gentleman got caught by one of these. He was suffering with mild form early stage dementia. He lost £250,000. You pay the money for the ticket in advance. If you haven't bought a ticket, how can you be entered in the lottery? You know, it just doesn't happen. Investment fraud. Again, it typically targets people, 50s and over, people who've retired, they may have got a lump sum. Uh, it can be dressed up as a pension liberation fraud, but you're guaranteed high returns. The victims, you'd be con people will be contacted completely out of the blue. Or it may be someone who you think you know, be preferred by a friend. They'll convince you to invest in a scheme, a policy. The returns will be phenomenal. There's nowhere out there which legitimately is going to return 40%, 50% on your investment. They will tell you it does, but they say you've got to act quickly. It's always act, act quickly. And they say, you know, you may pay £100 and you get £200 back as you're thinking. Blimey, that's good. It's a hook. That's a baited hook. Once you take that bait, you're on the line. Basically, if it sounds too good to be true, just think 45%, 50%, does that really exist? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The investments can control, include crypto, cryptocurrency, which I find that quite scary, uh, and I'm quite tech savvy. Uh, investment. If you get something like this, before you make an investment, just think, does that sound really good? And check. There's authority out there. Financial Conduct Authority is always a good starting place. 
any general investors, any registered investors, should be registered with the Financial and Cond Conduct Authority. Yes. I think there's a particularly nasty variant of that. Um, the day after I started registering as disabled, a supposedly a friend got in touch with me through Facebook Messenger to say that there was a charity that would give me um, would give me gives out money to people who are disabled to help them maintain their standard of living but you've got to act quickly and that raised all kinds of alarm bells on me but that was the um, did they ask for any payment up front they didn't because i didn't let it get that far that is typical um they may well have asked you said right to do this you need 100 pounds off us and then you pay that and then suddenly you're hooked and the increasing amounts then you lose money Next one, romance and dating fraud, also <coughs> called relationship fraud. Nowadays, gone are the days of going down the local pub or the club, chatting to someone face to face, speaking to them, asking them out for a date, and building. My daughter's done it. She's met her current boy partner. They've been together two years. They met online. Twenty percent of all dating be like, begins online nowadays. With COVID, that's increased. And that's an increasing figure. Fraudsters, they'll use fake personas to trap people, to convince them. And they'll strike up a relationship. Some people say, oh, it happens around Valentine's Day. It doesn't. It happens all the way through the year. They'll use very manipulative language. Softly, softly approach very first, soon. But they'll quote undying love at a very early stage. And they'll persuade and exploit the victims. They won't ask for money straight away because that would raise alarm bells. They use hijacked images and there are methods which can use, there's sources out there which you can use where you can reverse search on an image. So you see an image on a website, if you can't do it, your children will be able to do it. Certainly my kids will probably do it better than me. And they can look back and they'll find out that Colonel Jones, who's an American Marine serving in Afghanistan, is actually someone who works in a 7-Eleven store in the States. They'll reverse engineer. They'll use false identities, say regular ones, doctors, oil workers, armed forces, often serving overseas, traveling. And they'll de declare very strong feelings of love very early in the conversations. They build a relationship and then suddenly bang, I need some money, I've got an emergency medical care, money to pay for transport. They're asking someone who they've never met to send them a fortune. How many people who you know ask you for money? And yet victims will get so entrapped because these people are clever. And they'll ask for money and take it straight away. The commonality with this is loneliness, okay? Generally people there who are looking for companionship are alone. They believe they've lost a loved one. They're struggling to make a relationship. Disproportionate number of gay men are targeted. Um, but it ha hits all age ranges across the board. And generally, people become very secretive. They actually believe. They'll believe their fraudster rather than we turn up and say, you're, you're being tricked. You can't. They'll believe the, co the fraudster rather than believe the police. They may, you may end up being saying, oh, by the way, can you just pass this money from me to so-and-so? So they're actually acting as money launderers now, working for an organised crime group. Massive, again, <coughs> massive emotional, financial, psychological impact. Lose all the money, and they thought they were in love with the person <coughs> who was going to be their forever partner, and it's a fraud. A couple of easy guiders. Online dating, You're not meant to met someone in person. Don't send them money. Don't purchase. And we're seeing a lot now where can you buy some Amazon gift cards? Take a photo of them and send the code. Send and send photos of the code, the cards to me. Transfer money on their behalf. Take out a loan. Don't provide copies of your personal documents. Don't allow access to your bank accounts. Basically, if you wouldn't do it to someone who you met face to face, why would you do it to someone online? This is one which is particularly relevant as treasurers, payment diversion fraud. Also, got other names, mandate fraud, business email, chronicle fraud, and it's 
where electronic financial transactions are taking place. It's your world. Um, and fraudsters will contact a business or an individual by email, and they'll claim to be from a certain organisation that you've been dealing with. So somehow they've got that information, various different methodologies. I'm not going to go into the why's or wherefore, but basically they know that you've been dealing with XYZ pet food company, or they'll pretend to be the vicar and ask for money. And they'll trick you into transferring funds. One case was the treasurer of a church up in the North East of New England. She was contacted by someone. The email was very similar. She thought it was a vicar. She said, can you pay £5,000 into this account? She thought, yeah, it's the rev. Off we go, £5,000 gone. Next day, another request came through. Can you pay another £3,000 into this account? She thought, hmm, something not right here. So she found the vicar. He didn't know anything about it. She was mortified. They want you to panic. Maybe a final demand. Why are you being pressured? And it doesn't just happen to individuals. I've seen it where Tesco paid a quarter of a million pound to a supplier for services rendered. Unfortunately, the supplier, their email had been compromised and the money went overseas. So it's not just individuals, it's big corporates. If it's urgent, is it really urgent? Act now. They may suppose as someone in authority, whether it be someone from the diocese, whether it be the vicar. Just stop, make a phone call. It takes two minutes, check. How many times do people change their bank accounts that quickly? It doesn't happen very often, does it? And again, report it. If we know about the phone numbers, the email addresses, etc., then we may not be able to identify the suspect, but we'll identify where it's coming from, and we can be aware that this is suddenly happening in this area. Example, two email addresses here. Have a quick look. Tell me what, see if you can spot any issues with the email addresses. Anyone seen anything? Or are they the same? We've got three changes in the email address, but for all intents and purposes, yeah, it's on the screen far away away, but if you look at the red there, use different symbols. That's kind of touches the end point, particularly with ones, I's, and L's. Uh, antique dealer had a lovely piece of furniture for sale. There was a genuine buyer, there was a genuine seller. So the customer purchased this item from the vendor and he left a cash deposit. Furniture was delivered, the agreement was that payment would be made on delivery. So the customer received his goods and he received an email from the seller with an invoice. Gave the bank details and the amount owed. A few hours later there was another email received by the victim from the same email address. So this was an email compromise. And he said, sorry, sent you the wrong bank details. Can you pay into this two and a half thousand pounds? So, customer paid the money into the bank. Happy days, the customer's got his goods, he's paid his money, he's happy. The vendor sat there saying, where's my money? The money had been paid into the bank account of some low life in South Wales who withdrew the money as cash, passed it to a Nigerian who sent it by a money service business to Nigeria, overseas. That was an email compromise. Courier fraud. Uh, 3,200 reports in 2021-22, losses exceeding 14 million. We'll often start with a cold call from bank, from someone claiming to be a police officer. Paddington Police Station is a favourite. <laughs> and they'll say, there's been an issue with your bank account. We're investigating a corrupt bank official. They'll spin some story. And then, they'll do one of several things. <coughs> your bank card's due to expire. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send someone down to collect your bank card. You've just gotta give us the PIN number of that card. We'll send a courier and then you get a new one. 
guess what, you hand over the card. Money's gone. What we need is we're investigating a corrupt official. We need you to purchase XYZ, maybe a Rolex watch, maybe some gold bullion, and get it transferred for us for the purposes of the investigation. The other favourite. We've got a corrupt official, we're looking at counterfeit cash. We need you to withdraw money and hand it to us so we can check it to make sure it's not counterfeit. Courier turns up, take your money, turn up. And it's all very plausible. They may phone you and say, yeah, can you call us back on this number? So you put the phone down, pick the phone up. Funny, no dial tone, but you dial the number anyway. They've kept the line open. So you're actually speaking to the fraudster. The police, the banks, will never ever ask you or ask anyone for personal banking details. They'll never ask you to transfer money. We'll never ask you to hand over goods. Or we'll never send anyone to collect cash or property. There's a lot of other fraud types, we've touched on them. So one which is particularly prevalent, we flagged it to City of London. There was a broad there's been a media campaign about it. Hello Mum, I've lost my phone. I've got to pay a bill urgently, £3,000. Can you pay it for me? Stop. Phone back. Phone the original number. Ignore the text message. £1.5 million went missing between February and June this year. NHS and HMRC, the old favourites. You've been in contact with someone who's got COVID. Click on this link. Don't. There's an issue with your national insurance number. You've underpaid your tax. You've overpaid your tax. There's a warrant out for your arrest. Yeah, it doesn't happen. If in doubt, you can always log on to the .gov website, but don't follow any links. As I said, the main fraud type in the UK is check online banking fraud, where people buy things they've seen on Facebook Marketplace, lo and behold, they don't turn up. Or they turn up and the box has just got a piece of paper saying, ha ha, no goods. You may get some calls which look like genuine. I had a phone call about three months ago from a number which came up on my phone. And it was Sky. You know, you've, uh, the mobile phone you've ordered, it's been sent to such and such an address. If you want to check who we are, you can Google our number. And it just set alarm bells ringing. There's little hairs tickets on the back of the neck. Oh, something not right here. So I hung up, contacted Sky. Someone had made 10 attempts, 10 calls into Sky Call Centre to try and access information from my account. They'd got various little snippets of information. They were trying to get my bank account details. The potential was that they could have got into my bank account. So, that's all the nasty stuff. That's what's out there, you know. The environment, it, it's saturated out there. Everybody is a potential target. Everyone will get some kind of contact for a victim. What can you do to mitigate the risk? All sorts of things. There's things called true call units, which is something which we have provided in the past, but they're available to purchase. They're basically for a landline phone, and certainly in this, a lot of people will still have landline phones, particularly with mobile phone reception being so bad. And they basically, they will block any unwanted calls. You can program them, you can tell them to stop certain numbers. The BT Call Guardians, excellent phone sets, I've got one myself. And basically, you can program in the numbers, and if a number comes through, which is either unannounced, so it's from a call centre or something, or it's someone that the phone you haven't programmed in, it will ask the caller, it'll tell the caller that it's a monitored call, and to announce themselves and give a name and press hash. Um, quite a lot of the service providers now have got their own call blocking facilities. There's apps on the phones. True Caller, Hire, there's many apps available. Um, they're not perfect, they're free, but they'll stop a proportion of the calls. They'll stop them getting through to you. And these are quick hits which can help mitigate the waste report. Action fraud. That is the main national fraud reporting service for fraud and cyber. 
The rule of the range is trading standards, citizen <coughs> advice, but that is recognised generally as being the main tool for reporting fraud, cyber attacks. Report it here, please. If it's not an emergency, 101. If you think it's urgent, dial 999. 7726, if you get a suspicious text message, forward it to 7726. What they'll do is they'll collate the number. 7726, by the way, on your phone, that spend, spells the word spam. 7726 is S-P-A-M. It's an easy way to remember it. Forward your text message on to that. It gives us an indication as to what numbers are being used. They may be dropped, but it gives us a geographic location. It's giving them an indication as to where they are. We may be able to get data from the servers, which will allow us to go back and look at that and deal with the people who own that number. Emails, forward them to report at phishing.gov.uk. Again, it's data collection. Crime stoppers, if you want to make an anonymous report, we want to stop people becoming victims of fraud. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much. <laughs> Poor old Neil. I think it's too good to be true. Possibly is. Okay. <laughs>